thought enough about that situation to fly her to the United States, get free health care in the United States, take care of her here, and fly her home, along with her mother and her personal physician from Haiti. So those are the type of things that we are also going to be involved in in terms of homeland security. International outreach and global perspectives is what we need to be thinking about. Nurses are the single largest health care discipline in the entire country. There's no argument about that. It's not physicians, it's not EMS workers, it's not anybody else that's nursing. 2.7 to 2.9 degrees, but because we are the largest, most available number of healthcare providers, it's critical that we are not only responders to these incidents, but that we're planners in these incidents. It's going to be really, really critical that we do that. One research article that I recently read said that 85% of all responders to disasters are nurses. 85%. Okay, and many of those, I would suggest most of those, are not people that are a part of any formal team or preparation. They're simply people who volunteer their services. And so I say that that many nurses are going to be involved in that, and maybe we need to be more involved in the front end instead of just told her to go and what to do. That's what nurses need to be much more involved. Okay, so those are the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay, so how the heck did I get involved in all this? Yeah, I often wonder myself. It's been a really long and very strange road, but um, I started an EMS in Tampa, Florida, uh, where I grew up. And I was a paramedic in Florida for about seven years, and EMS was all I wanted to do. It's what I did. It's what I loved. Okay? But I wanted to learn more, and a local community college started doing a paramedic to RN transition program that accounted for our 24 on 40 off schedule. And so it was really interesting because I was able to go to this program and become an RN, even though I, I wasn't one of those people that dreamed from the time I was a kid, uh, uh, you know, becoming a nurse. But it was the next reasonable step that was made available to me and I could keep my job. Why would I not do that? So I did the paramedic to RN transition program and uh, worked in hospital and CBIT mostly emergency department, and for many years as a hospital educator, where I worked with PRN and units that did all this critical care education, ACLS, BCLS, one time to VA catheters, blah, blah, blah. So, I was CCR certified, CEM certified, and a nursing educator for a long time. Well then, as is typical with my career, I decided I wanted to become a family nurse practitioner. So, I went from Dothan, Alabama, anybody know where Dothan is? Southeast corner of the state, right? Went from Dothan to Mobile every week, three and a half hours. Back and forth, back and forth. In fact, I got dizzy. I hey, did my uh, master's and became a family practitioner because it was the closest program. It was the closest program to me at that time. And in my area, and some of you will experience this, how many of you have plans to become nurse practitioners eventually? Wow. How many, okay, now here's a $50 million question. How many of you have plans to become nurse anesthetists eventually? Yeah, maybe. Wonder why that is, right? Let me get out my wallet and see if I can take donations from you guys ahead of time, right? <laughs> that is where the money is. But I'll be honest and tell you that was where I was originally going. But man, I got sick of hearing cases at the EMS provider. I said, no more. And you know what? I really like the interaction with patients. And I thought, if I put people to sleep and sit there for six hours while they do cardiac surgery, I'm going to go loony tunes. I won't be able to sit there the whole time. I won't go crazy. Um, as you see, I don't stand behind the podium. I would have probably sat the patient's head during this, and it would have been looking at me. So, I became a family practitioner. I worked in a family practice in a rural care area, which was very interesting for me because I went from all this critical care, highly critical care, to this ambulatory care. And I was like, man, give me somebody who can't breathe, and I'm okay, but don't give me a skin rash. I mean, I don't know, you know, put, put some water on it. I, I, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really care. Critical care was entirely different. But you know what it did? Because that's what was in my area. There were no acute care nurse practitioners in my area. Family nurse practitioners, none of them being hired. I had a acute care and critical care background, so I did family. And I feel like I'm a lot more well-rounded because of that. I feel like I can go take care of patients that are ambulatory, or go and take care of patients that are critical, because I understand both. And so, when you have these opportunities, sometimes it may not seem like it fits, but you have to sometimes go with your opportunities, and many times it will pay off. And in that case, I believe for me it's easy. 
So I'm now a faculty member at the University of Auburn High School, which I've already told you about, um, coordinating the Nutcracker Research Program, both the Hughes and family, and, and really enjoy that. A few years ago, I decided to go back and, and do a PhD, and the DNP was getting ready to come around, and I knew that I wanted to do a PhD because of being in academia. And so I started looking at I visited Vanderbilt, I visited UAB, I visited Knoxville, I visited a lot of campuses. And I heard about this person grant, a million dollar person grant that started a program in Homeland Security Nursing in Knoxville. And it was the only program of its type in the entire country. There are no other PhDs in nursing with a Homeland Security Specialty in the entire country. And I said, you know what, I think I'll do that. How far away is it? This is me you're talking about, right? Four hours every week, there and back. Okay. I'd a few years ago, I had done Mobile there and back, there and back. Now what am I doing? Knoxville, Huntsville, Knoxville, there and back, there and back, every single week. So I got coursework done in about a little over two years. So this PhD, instead of being 65 hours, like most of them, come in. Instead of uh, being 65 hours, like most programs, it's 89 hours. Thank you, Klein. You're cool. You're telling them everything's good. I'm not going to provide everything for your screaming. Mama! 
healthcare facilities, whatever they are, and put them into the system and do civil air patrol flyovers so that now the imagery on Google Earth for our state is pixel set instead of normal Google Earth, which is a pixel, one picture pixel every 10 meters, this is one pixel every six inches. So you can imagine the zoom and the, uh, the um, resolution of the imagery is absolutely incredible. So this is the uh, Marriott that's right next to the Space and Rocket Center. So I was just trying to show you this. So I could zoom down into that pool and see the people in the pool. And that's how clear and distinct this is. And so when that county buys in and says, here, we're going to go make geospatial information, they become then those managers in that county, only government employees, become uh, subscribers. And they have access to the rest of the state data. So it's a win-win. It doesn't cost the taxpayers a dime. They contribute data. They become a subscriber. So being involved in the program from a healthcare perspective, I was able to be a subscriber, and I could sit at home on my computer and tie into the Birmingham traffic cameras and watch the traffic go around. And then what they did is, with this imagery, is they they put layers, floodplains, video imaging of the inside of critical infrastructure, our our civic center. We can go in and pull up cameras, and we have pre-recorded video of every room. So we can say, we need a room for triage or staging. Let's look at room 4A, click, and scan the room and see exactly what the room looks like from a laptop computer at home. Um, the fire department has gone through and started to do sketch-ups of the building so that if we say, this is the building where this person is going to have a tactical appointment to catch this person, the building will pop up, and you can do a virtual walkthrough of every floor, every fire extinguisher, every door. It's literally amazing. And it's because the pixels are so close, the topographical information is incredibly good as well. That's only a, a small portion of the things that this program could do. And it is being put, in fact, I've been on part of the pitches to Oklahoma and Nevada and uh, Hawaii. A lot of states are very interested in this. Um, and I believe that this will eventually be the, the national situational awareness tool uh, that was started in Alabama. So just to give you an example, what I did is I backed out of Limestone County, which is closer to where I live, and I pulled up the school So this tells me where the water would stand in a six-foot flood. And if you notice, the far left, you see Coward Elementary is completely out of water. But look down, look at the uh, Career Technical Center down the bottom. It's in the water. And you see the other ones that I would be able to see, okay, this needs to be evacuated first, and this needs to be evacuated next. This is which way they need to go. And they, when they evacuate, they can't go that way. They need to go this way. So just, I, I wish I could spend the whole afternoon just going to the way this part.
different cars will be on the road or whatever. But you see how incredibly tight it can be stitched to look at the damage later on. So that's just a few of the things that can do. And again, situational awareness is one of the things that the government has said on multiple occasions. It's one of the number one weaknesses that we have. That's been stated in many, many, many post-Katrina, post-9-11, uh, post-Rita conferences in, in reports to the House of Representatives. We don't have sufficient information sharing and situational awareness. It's one of the things we need to do better. And that's one of the things that this program is accomplishing in Alabama, and I believe will accomplish nation, nationwide. So what I wanted to do then was say, okay, if situational awareness is so important, then I'm going to deal with this. And again, this is one of those opportunity things that I was telling you about. I want to study situational awareness as part of my dissertation. If it's that important nationally and locally and everywhere else, then I, that's what I want to study for my dissertation. So that's what I did. Okay, now, uh, the copyright is pending on this. I hope we get it published in the next six months or a year. I've I got to defend my dissertation first. Um, copyright pending, ma'am. Taking the picture. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, but the important part, I'm, I'm just teasing. I hope you do spread it. <laughs> but the, the important thing was that I, I started looking at situational awareness as a, as a um, concept. Now, how many, how many of you here are faculty members? Anybody faculty members? Yay! Still faculty members. How many of you are, well, that's a dumb question. The rest of you are students, right? Okay, so how many of you love concepts and love theory? That's what I thought. Seven. How many people are in here? You know, 75 or 100. Okay, you cannot move forward on research, move forward on how to take care of patients, move forward with what we call evidence-based practice without concepts, theory, and research. So get used to it. Now, I'm not saying you have to love all of the old, um, I, I say old, everything had its purpose. But some of the old grand theorists and things that you see, you saw as less applicable, listen, my theory that, I'm, that I produced is very substantive. That means that it's not applied everywhere. It's only applied to the circumstances in which I developed it. But there's mid-range, there's substantive, and there's formal theory. It just depends on what you need to use it for. But research drives practice, and what we're learning now, what we better find out, and what I hope you guys carry with you, is that practice drives research. It has to be both ways. So this is a theory that I came up with for um, situational awareness and multicast I wanted to go more antecedent. National, you got lots of players, jurisdictions, managers, all this stuff. What's the smallest thing that I can look at that happened a lot so that I would actually have a sample of people that I could research? And it was multicast that happened every day all over the country. And so I did this. Now, what I think my core phenomenon would be in multicast incidents? What would any healthcare worker think the core phenomenon would be? Auto accidents? Well, okay, that's the contextually based incident. Absolutely, it was the number one. But what would be the core phenomenon? Wouldn't you think it would be patient care? I mean, wouldn't you think that would be what most people would focus on? It wasn't. It wasn't. What my participants told me was is that establishing control of this thing was the most important thing. And what was more important than patient care still, on another level, was safety. Okay, so if I go into an incident and I'm trying to provide care at all costs, I will provide care at all costs. I'm not trying to provide care at all costs. I'm trying to provide care safely. And so if I can't do it safely, victims are victims. Why do we have triage? Do we provide the same level of care for every patient in an incident? <laughs> no. If a patient let's say, has a pulse and is not breathing, and I have 100 people to triage, that patient is what? Dead. Dead. Now, what would that patient be in a hospital? A code. Everybody in the world would be coming. Right? So it's a whole different way of thinking. We can't apply the same exact strategies in all situations. Safety was most important. It's a critical thing for us to understand. So, again, the PhD program, way too long. I don't know if I want to do all that and did it. Became involved in Universal Alabama. It was a great opportunity for me. Began to research situational awareness. You can't know where your career is going. But you take the next step and the next opportunity and the next opportunity. And, and things happen. So find out what your interests are and then pursue them. Okay, so for you guys, what's important? If you start looking for things and you get interested, what you need to understand is what the concepts are. There's a lot of words out there. And if you do literature search, you'll see emergency response, disaster response, disaster management. Homeland Security now, blah, blah, blah. A whole bunch of different words. What I want you to know is disaster response mostly deals with what do we do about this thing that happened. Whereas emergency preparedness is a much broader term, which I like, that 
says, what am I going to plan for? And then how am I going to respond to it? Much, much better way of thinking about things. Not just what am I going to do once the milk is spilled. How am I going to plan to avoid spilling the milk, right? That's a critical thing. And if you start looking at the home security, then you're going to see not only local, state, regional, national implications, but you're going to see international implications. There are things that are disaster. I, I published an article recently um, in a faith-based journal that was uh, talking about how nursing and uh, disaster planning can go together and should go together. And what I used as my example is the famine in Somalia. Now, that's not a disaster, but it's a disaster, right? The fighting in Somalia killed about 30,000 people. That's a lot of people. You know what the famine killed? 300,000. Basic food, water, medicine, things that nurses are responsible for most of the time. Okay, so some of those international efforts will be global, and they're not just fighting terrorism. There are other things that we can be doing. So Homeland Security needs to be thought about global. Now, we also need to think about all hazards approach. And one of the things that you're seeing that's changing, that instead of saying, this is my plan for bioterrorism, this is my plan for chemical, this is my plan for nuclear weapons, this is my plan for your everyday running a tornado, what you're seeing is people using a frame of emergency planning and then dealing with the particulars in the midst of it. And that's why FEMA forces have been so popular, NIMS and I mean, there's literally a couple of hundred of them that you can do free of charge on the internet under FEMA IS, Independent Study, and they will provide you with a color certificate that's really nice, and you will learn multiple things about disasters. So what we're talking about now is framing the problem and then dealing with the particulars in the middle. Now, we need to understand chemical weapons. We need to understand biological threats. We need to understand all those things, or we can't deal with it in the middle. But in terms of our response, the management structure, who answers to whom, who, is the, who are the medical care providers, are they set up, how do we get plan B in the event that they can't make it, what if blah, 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 blah. That's my frame. And then I put all the responses in the midst of that frame and deal with them individually. That's the way you're seeing things go. That's an all hazards approach. Now, take this in just for a second. And what, so what I was telling the other group, and, and I tell everybody, Anytime I speak about something that has to be on the security. We always say FEMA failed, there wasn't a FEMA failed, this was the situation in the world. Look at the scope of this disaster. Now, I, I, there was a Coast Guard guy in the first group that I just spoke to a few minutes ago. And I said, you know what? There's nowhere to put a helicopter down. There is no dry spot. That's a city that's completely flooded. City in a flood. He said, you couldn't even get around boats because there was so much debris. You couldn't even drive a boat. There were cars and boards and homes and everything else in the water. So the problem is, it's not as simple as you think it's going to be. Now, admittedly, this was highly complicated. And one, there was not an event, but a series of events. There was a hurricane, and then there was a huge flood when the levees broke. Those are two different incidents which contributed to this overall incredible disaster. But this picture was taken by a friend of mine in the time on Alabama one. He's on Tennessee one, DMAC team, from a Black Hawk helicopter going to the Superdome to take care of these people. Now, this is what they're seeing. And then when they get to the Superdome, that's what they see. Okay, now, this is a 35-person team. <laughs> I want to go home, right? That's just the tens of thousands of people outside the dome, not the ones inside the dome. Okay. Now, what happened is, is they provided care for as long as they could, and then they eventually had to get out of the dome. How? One at a time. People in this dome, they're desperate and need water and food and care for grandma and care for the baby and care for whomever. See the health care workers leaving in mass? There's a riot. They had to leave one at a time. And I've got another picture, which I wish I had included, of a FEMA truck with four bullet holes through the FEMA sign on the side of the truck. Why? Because we're not getting what we need, right? So before we put blame, this was an incredibly difficult situation. And the people involved were incredibly desperate. There's not anything that I wouldn't do to get water for my little girl. 
nothing. There's not a thing on the face of this earth that I wouldn't do. So when you have people stuck inside this dome with no bathrooms, no water, no food, with grandma who has diabetes and needs insulin, and I'm 954th in line at the pharmacy, desperate times, desperate times. So did we fully understand the situation that we were getting into? Obviously not. We did not appreciate what it was going to take to provide care for these people. So situation awareness in all of these humongous situations is all of this critical. We don't know what we're dealing with, we can't plan for it or deal with it. Okay, so how should you think about things? I think the way you should think about it is in the level of foci. Local focus versus national focus. Do you want to be involved? Think about it this way. Okay, locally, you're talking about local state agencies, local planning, emergency planning committees. You're talking about um, MMRS, which I'll talk about in a minute. Regional responses, where there's memoranda of understanding and um, uh, mutual aid agreements, county to county, state to state, region to region, whatever. You're talking about usually natural events, tornadoes, floods, severe thunderstorms, uh, fires, blah, blah, blah. Now, could a terrorist attack occur in the city and you would still have to have a local response? Absolutely. <coughs> Most emergency plans in a locale are supposed to be able to sustain themselves without federal help for 72 hours. Now that don't sound like a lot unless you're the person down there making the decision. And then 72 hours is a long, long time. So we need to have this, but it doesn't mean that's only what we're supposed to. On the global level, of course, terrorism. Border protection. Where are we seeing big border issues right now? Mexico. Big, big border issues. The Mexican, quote unquote, not my words there, the Mexican mafia are now moving into all of the southern states. And I saw a news article the other day, a news uh, story, I think it was on NBC, talking about where they had placed seeds in the United States. Seeds meaning a group of people that were establishing criminal activity. One of them was Huntsville. I said, well, I live in Huntsville. They can't be there, right? You would not even know it. You would never even know it existed. Okay? And we also have foreign interests, which we already talked about briefly. You're usually talking, in this case, about high-level high level government agencies being involved. So let me briefly stack this up for you, and, and uh, I want to leave enough time at the end to, to answer some questions. On the left, you've got the local. Now, if somebody asked me in the last class, or the last, this thing, Paul. How do you get involved? I think that what you ought to do is find out who your local emergency plant management agency is and how they get together with their local organization. Ours is called the Madison County Emergency Planning Committee. All right. So that means that what I started doing was inviting myself to that meeting <laughs> and started shaking hands like I knew what I was doing. Right? I see Bud oh yeah, I'm with UAH, you know, I'm supposed to be here. You know, and they're like, oh, okay, nice to meet you. You know, and my wife and I moved from Dothan to Huntsville, so I knew all the doctors, I knew every, all the nurses, all the EMS providers in Dothan, I knew everybody. When I moved to Huntsville, I didn't know anybody. So when I started going back to school and getting involved in all this, I just started inviting myself to those meetings and got involved in a lot of things. I took a group of master's students to a local uh, full-scale incident at our Huntsville International Airport, Airport, which is a seminated event. Did all the triage, did all the triage tags, provided patients, were involved in some really unique ways, simply because I showed up at those meetings and met the EMS director and the fire department guy and the local emergency planner, the, the director of the emergency management agency for Madison County. So find out where they meet and get involved in that if you're interested, and that's the best way to find out. If you are working in a hospital, look at the bottom. Now, I have been a nurse, paramedic, all that for a long time, and I've worked in facilities. I mean, what we used to do in disaster plans was, oh, joint commission's coming? <laughs> right? <laughs> Put it in a place of prominence, that's our disaster plan, and we know it well. Right? Then when joint commission's gone, back on the shelf, close the door, whatever. So, my point is this. It could be as simple as you getting out that manual and either rewriting it, fixing it, making it more user-friendly, not so complicated, not appendix C and D and go C 4A and then go back here and then ask your manager. You know, simple, straightforward directions and have a person on the unit that opens that and reads it and says, this is what we're supposed to do. That's a very simple thing that can be done. Now, the MMRS is the medical, uh, Metropolitan Medical Response System, and that is set up by the Department of Homeland Security, and it provides funds and other assistance
equipment training for local groups, like the Local Emergency Preparedness Committee, which is what the LEPC is, so that certain locales that they have named are ready. Huntsville is one of them. We have an MMRS there that's assisted by the Department of Homeland Security. And then there's the State Department of uh, Homeland Security. Uh, Alabama is the first state in the entire union, if you can believe that, to have the Department of Homeland Security person be on the governor's cabinet, not a managerial level person, but a cabinet level member. It's, it's that important, and that's why you're seeing some great strides come out of Alabama right now. Red Cross, those are known as non-governmental organizations, or BOAS, which is uh, volunteer organizations active in times of disaster. So be careful about that, because it depends on what it is you want to do. And please don't anybody take out of this room that I'm knocking Red Cross. I'm not. What I'm saying is, because of insurance purposes and others, but the lady in the earlier class mentioned insurance was a big part of it, they have very limited protocols. So if you're a nurse and you go to help, you're going to case manage, you're going to provide support, you're going to provide food, care, water, you're going to get up to the help they need, but you're not going to provide hands-on care. And providing hands-on care, i.e. shots, IVs, critical care, that kind of stuff, then it's a different organization that you need to be with, and you just need to decide what it is that you want to do, but understand the mission of the organization, then you can make the right uh, choice. On the right hand side, national is very complicated, but I want you to be aware of this because of the grief that FEMA got during Katrina. FEMA is no longer a cabinet level position. They, when the Department of Homeland Security was created, they were placed under DHS. And so Department of Homeland Security and Department of Health and Human Services are cabinet level positions. FEMA is not. FEMA is just an agency under DHS that performs perform certain functions search and rescue, mass care, food, water, shelter, blah, blah, blah. So it's really important to understand that DHS is responsible for that stuff. And of course, one of the reasons DHS was created is because of 9-11. Now, I cannot hardly remember a time when I don't think of the Department of Homeland Security existing. It's only been six years since we even had a Department of Homeland Security. That's pretty darn amazing. So if this is something that you're interested in, now's the time. Now's the time to get involved, because it's not going to go away. So, I, oh, hang on a second. Let me show you this real quick. On the right-hand side, I want to also briefly mention um, the DMAS, the Disaster Medical System Teams, is what, that's what I'm a part of. Uh, that is a national level. So I, I'm employed by them as a nurse practitioner. Now, as a nurse, so when I go, I work at the full scope of a nurse practitioner anywhere in this country or anywhere else internationally that they start. <coughs> So if that's the kind of hands-on care you want to provide, that might be more to your liking. If you don't want to start IVs and be responsible for all that stuff, but you want to help, Red Cross, who assists FEMA, is the place for you to be. So again, understand the mission and make yourself available in the area that supports what you want to do in that area. Strategic National Stockpile, there's many of those around the country. They are in secret locations. They are 100,000 pound medical supplies, medicines, ventilators, tubing, bandaging, not just medications, which is what people think. It takes eight semis to move just one of these, what they call pushbacks. And they can be available anywhere in the country within 12 hours of an uh, established need and request. Wow. And there's, I think, between 40 and 50 of them around the country. And then the National Response Framework. Again, this is a recent change. What we used to have at the national level was a national response plan. But now it's called a national response framework. Why? Because all hazards have to fit in this frame. And then we need to deal with those things individually as we decide what the heck they are and how best to deal with them. So the framework now, and that's available on DHS's website. You can download the entire thing. This framework uses what's called ESS, Emergency Support Functions. And there's 12 of them. And it says what the critical function is. Food and water, environmental services, health care, mass care, search and rescue. That's how they're labeled. And then there are government national level organizations that handle those things. Health care is ESF 8. That's what my VMAP team does. We provide health care, emergency support function 8, under the auspices of the Department of Health and Human Services. So this is a little thing I did. I didn't think it was not quite that funky, but just try to get past that. And see at the top, large scale events are multifaceted. About three down, you see the disaster declaration. The governor of the state says, we need help. The Stafford Act is kicked in. That makes money available, and federal teams are then free to respond to those areas where help is needed. So on the right-hand side, you see DHS and you see FEMA, 
And you see Red Cross's function. Red Cross function helps FEMA with mass care, emergency support function nine, food, water, shelter. That's Red Cross's primary function in time of national disaster. FEMA does ESF six and nine and many more things. I mean, many, many more things. Heavy equipment, moving of debris, blah, blah, blah. But these are healthcare ones that I think of. Emergency support function six is search and rescue. That's under FEMA. But now notice that ESF 8 used to be under FEMA. It is now under the Department of Health and Human Services on the right hand side. Does that make sense? Yes. In fact, I was in an epidemiology class before the changes were made. And I, had, I built a chart similar to this as part of my final project. And DMAPs were strung over to FEMA, even though they provide the healthcare. And I said, you know what we need to do? We need to move DMAP into the area that makes the most sense, and that's healthcare. The next year that actually happened. Can you believe that? I mean, I actually had one good thought. <laughs> so they moved me that over. Public Health Service, CDC, other volunteers, some of them paid, some of them not paid, and the DMAC came to provide health care in a time of national disaster where it is real, literal health care, life saving health care. And the DMAC had their own, what they call, booths, based of operations, it's its own freestanding hospital. A series of tents, about five tents, their sleeping quarters, health care, pharmacy, all these areas that are completely freestanding. So if you have people that you know that are interested in being on a DMAT team, they don't have to be a nurse or a doctor or a nurse practitioner or a, 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 a paramedic or something like that. They can be a mechanic. We need mechanics. They can be a logistics person. We need logistics people. It doesn't have to be a health care provider. Any of you guys or your family I said, Mom, now you know why they call it 
ICU. <laughs> that was original. I thought it was funny. Anyway, she did not think it was funny. And if she's going to preach me, I think she still would have me. I got my share when I was a kid. But anyway, it also provides really some of the most, the greatest satisfaction in the world, healthcare does. And I think there's going to be those times where you're going to know you're making a difference. I tell my students all the time, and I hope I don't offend any bakers here, we're not baking cookies here. We're doing something really important that really matters in somebody's life. And you won't remember each of those patients, but I promise they will remember you. They will remember the connection that they have with you because you will make a difference. Now, I also tell students, and so I will tell you guys, because you are students, patients don't know the difference in Celebrex and Omni stuff. They don't know the difference in Amoxel and Augment. You do though, right? Just shake your head yes and humor me. Thank you. Good. So, <laughs> You know the difference in those things. Patients don't. They only know how you treat them. So if you treat people right, then they're going to think you're the best nurse in the world. And you know what the greatest thing is to be? Be the best nurse in the world. Don't just be the person that treats them nice and doesn't know the difference in a mox and augment. Be the person that knows the difference in a mox and augment and treats them really right. Because they're going to remember you. They're going to think you're the best nurse you ever had. And you know what? They're going to be right. There's going to be a lot of people that don't know the difference and treat them well and just say, oh, they're a nice person. A lot of people that know the difference in all the and all the awesome don't have a bedside view of their briefings. And they're, they're not going to care. They're going to think you're the worst health care provider in the world. They only know how you treat them. I was, I've got across the top of my credenza cards from students where they've sent me little things and said thanks for helping me get through this or get through that or whatever. And it, it's what I call my inspiration shelf because when you have a hard day, that's the place I look to say, this is why I do. Not to pat myself on the back, say this is why I do what I do. I have letters from patients when I was in the hospital, I have a whole scrapbook of EMS. And there are those times that are just difficult. And I was telling another group, there was a night one time when I was uh, responding with my partner on a cold, 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 wet night these kids that had rolled a truck. And this truck rolled and rolled and rolled and it just so happened that when the truck came to rest, the roof slammed against the tree. And when it did, it crushed the driver's head, brains and blood and junk everywhere. Well, here's this truck sitting here on its back, almost on its back, leaning against the tree. Crawl inside, mud, blood, gray matter. You know, I'm thinking at 2 o'clock in the morning, what the, am I doing here? This guy's hanging here in the passenger seat with a seatbelt, cannot breathe, closed head injury, completely unresponsive, obviously broken leg. This kid's not going to live. Oh, this is horrible. What are we going to do? We've got to get this truck off me. Anyway, secures the airway to the thing. Fire department helps us get the vehicle up enough to pull the guy out. And I'm just saying, this guy's going to die. This is such a frustrating situation. Of course, I'm thinking in my mind, they're drunk, they roll this truck, one kid's dead, and another one. It's a very, very emotionally draining thing. This is the actual picture from the gym. Now, look at the date on this. This was more than 20 years ago. I'm an old guy. I can't remember this crap. So I keep it. And you know what? I look back and I remember that what I'm doing is important. And that's what you guys are going to do. Keep this stuff. I'm going to pass all this crap on to my kids when I get old. They're going to say, oh, this is pretty cool. Listen on my shelf somewhere. But what I do with it is I look at it and I remember why I'm doing what I'm doing. And you should do the same thing. A month later, I got this letter in my personal file from his mother and father. The kid survived. This is the actual letter. It says, thanks for taking care of our son, David, on Sunday evening, 17 years old. David has closed hands for his own class, fractured his leg, he's on his own for 17 days. Look down at the bottom of that same column. He's home now and doing better every day. Look at the next page. The trauma team at Canada General didn't think he was going to make it because of other problems associated with his injuries. But he did. Thank God. I'm glad they put him in this where it belongs there. And all of you that were there to help him that night. We can never repay you for what you did. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you. God bless you all. That is why we do what we do. And that's why you're going to do what you do. Thank you very much for having me today.
I want to answer any questions that you might have. Anybody have questions? Or I always tell my students questions, comments, and I remarks. You think it's different? I think you're going to. Um, that was in uh, about 2005, two years after DHS came into being. Remember, before it was only, there was the Department of Health and Human Services, which included CDC and DHS, but the only emergency people there were was FEMA. There was no DHS. But when DHS came into being and DMAS was providing health care, and they saw how dysfunctional it was in 9 11 and in Katrina, which occurred in uh, August of 2003, is that right? Or 2009. Five, that is when that change was made right after that. After yeah, right after that, late 2005, early 2006. Yes? Um, I appreciate that you look at these global um, issues as disasters. I look at international nurses and travel around the world and help in these situations. And I'm currently a second semester nurse in the program, and I just need some advice as to um, maybe which degree to pursue, but I want to get out there and do something. Yeah, that's great. I had that question actually in the first class, but here's what I'll say about that. I will say don't let your least degree limit what it is you want to do. I will say to every one of you in here, get every degree that you can get. Because what it will do is it will open some doors for you that your effort alone will not. So you could be an ADM nurse, which I was. I, I did a two-year nursing degree, and at the same time I did a EMS education AS, then I did a bachelor's degree, then I did a master's degree, now I'm finishing a BC. I was, I did, I was one of those hardheads that did it that way. But I have still had opportunities because I've tried to make those opportunities, and you will do the same. But I wanted to be in academia, so before DMP came in, I realized that a PhD was important to me. That PhD will open some doors for me that only the piece of paper will do. But my effort will open some doors that only the effort will do. When you have them both, it helps a lot. So I will say this to you. Don't limit your degrees. Don't stop until you get a PhD. If you can't, or life circumstances, or your family, or whatever it keeps you from, then don't let the limits of your degree dictate what you can do. Go do it. What else? Yes, ma'am.
What is your population? Okay, what's your role? Your advanced practice nurse. What's your population? Family, child, geriatric, adult, whatever. And then your specialty. So if you go to an ER training and you're a pediatric nurse practitioner, you're not going to be able to treat adults. You'll be working outside your scope. If you're an adult nurse practitioner and you get ER training, you can't see pediatric patients. You're working outside your scope. I think some people have that false impression that they can get that extra training in the ER and it's suddenly going to cover for their role and their responsibilities, and it's not. You still have to only practice within your scope of practice. So you guys would be emergency nurse practitioners with pediatric abilities. Absolutely necessary. Kids are going to come in her. No question about that. And then don't forget, you're still a nurse. Right? You might not prescribe or take care of an Alzheimer's patient or, or uh, you know, prescribe for a diabetic patient as an adult, but you're still a nurse. You can still perform, perform every function that a nurse can perform. Anything else? Okay, thanks again. I'm going to put my name back up for my nine.